Well, Rob, welcome to this space. This is the soothing the unsettled mind. And the reason why I chose that, I was talking with one of my friends, Brian, who he, we were trying to figure out what direction we wanted to go with this. And we were both describing what it felt like before we found the principles and still what it sometimes feels like after we found the principles. And we found that it feels like kind of we're, we're searching, we're unsettled, we're, we're missing this piece that we think we're not good enough, that we think we need to find something in order to feel complete and whole. And some of us feel that way because of trauma. So that's why I wanted to bring you into this conversation. And we'll have a conversation for about 20 to 30 minutes about what you've seen in this space around trauma and you can share other things as well. And a little bit about our guest. Rob is a trauma coach and he is the founder of Life After Trauma, highly respected speaker and coach. He helps individuals with PTSD and other traumatic experiences to prioritize self-care, heal, and build meaningful lives. Welcome, Rob. Hi, oh, thank you, Rich. I was just thinking, am I going to be on YouTube? Whoa, I didn't know that part. I was about to take my voice off. I didn't know if I wanted to be on I'm joking, man. Thank you for having me, man. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've had a couple of questions, so a couple of people are curious how you're seeing things differently. Yeah. And and also how you approach that that the fact that this that lizard brain kind of operates faster than our intellectual mind yeah uh but let's let's dive into a conversation you can take it where you like and i'll i'll help you spark some of the insights as well yeah well what what are you seeing more recently around trauma that that is really helping people um that there's two sides to the coin and and what i mean by that is after the traumatic experience, where's I don't even have a coin here with me. It's probably over there. We, um, when we go through something traumatic, our senses, us being human, our sight, smell, touch, hearing, you know, things like that. They, they basically go into this mode of recording everything that's actually happening right now from sound to smell, to things that could see and whatever the case may be. Now, one of the things I've found over the years is that that recording is not a video. That recording is actually a snapshot. It's a picture. And each picture may have a few different frames missing in between. And what happens is I feel that gap to create the whole narrative for myself. And, and what I began to see was in those gaps where I was putting information that was not accurate, that was actually helping cause my suffering. Um, the piece, the gap, one of the biggest gaps that I found was after the traumatic experience, which is why I, I named the, the company Life After Trauma, because it was like the conversations I was having always seemed to allude to people still being in the trauma. Even myself, when I explained, I I retired. I was on stages teaching and talking, and here I am talking about being shot at and explosions and feeling as if I'm being shot at with explosions happening, but I'm actually not. I'm actually safely on stage at an event. So how is it that I really feel like bullets and are flying and and explosions are happening? when I'm not there. And that's when I really got interested into this uh, and decided to kind of challenge everything I'd ever been taught. I do have a clinical diagnosis of PTSD. Um, I have been to psychologists, therapists, doctors, whatever you want to call it, about um, my so-called adverse effects. And I think what's been 
the biggest or most eye-opening thing here recently happened within the last couple months is every one of the behaviors that I started doing as a result of the traumatic experience I had in the military were designed to protect me. They were designed to keep me safe as best as my system knows how. The numbness, the numbness was something I wrote about for years. I was numb. I couldn't feel. Life was, you know, whatever, how, you know, when you're in that, that voice or that tone. But I realized that numbness possibly saved my life. Because given the state of mind I was in going through all of that, and given what I was facing in my family, a divorce, high alcohol intake, my children not having a, a fear-based relationship of their father because they've seen me snap you know, as a result of the high intensity of my job. Um, I'm always scanning for threats. I was a protection agent. So every building I walk into, every person I interact with, I got to decide if they're a threat to my life and the person I'm protecting within the first three seconds of our conversation or I stand in likelihood of dying. So that, that transition was hard when I was living in regular world no longer deployed, being shot at, but still applying those rules. And so for me, that's when I saw what PTSD was. Post-traumatic stress disorder is one side of the coin that happens after a traumatic experience that says this side, this possibility to the traumatic event that you have will consistently scare the shit out of you and make you feel like you're actively in the event, even though you're not. So the disorder is basically the inability to time travel. It's the, that's it. It's when you when when you're in a PTSD effect or when you're in a PTSD um, episode, so to speak. You're actually sitting safely in an environment while you have it, because the mind doesn't work that way. Because if you were actually in danger, you would just be responding to the danger. So the mere fact that you have the ability to sit and rationalize what's a particular threat, am I in danger, or, means you're safe. Because the brain wouldn't allow to do that. When you're in danger, you just act. You just respond. You just do. And then comes an awareness like, oh, my God, what, what happened? Um, about, I think it was the last Christmas. So I have a, a, a bonus son who is, he was very much riddled in his mind with anxiety. And he was very scared about life. And to, to uh, Wendy's point, I'm sitting talking to his dad and I'm um, talking to his brother and his, him and his sister are at the counter and they're making uh, at the dinner we're about to eat for the holiday. And something happens where a towel catches fire on the stove, falls off the stove, hits the trash can, trash catch on fire, and the dog is right there. By the time the table looked and saw the blaze of the fire, he had grabbed the trash can, ran it outside, and doused it with water, put it out, right? He walks back into the house with the, the no-fire trash can. After handling this situation, everybody is safe now. He sits the trash can down and holy crap, he went through it. He was like, oh my God, we could have died. The house could have burned down. The dog and this, and it was just like, bam, 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 bam. I mean, they were coming. Anything you could think of that could happen from a fire was hitting him. And I tapped his brother and I said, see that? He was like, yeah, that's serious. I said, is it? Because the fire's out. And he was just like, huh. Now I say that to say this to Rick's point. The very first thing that I thought my biggest insight was as it pertains to PTSD, I thought was learning I wasn't broken. No, that was, no, that was a earlier insight. The very first insight was there is a possibility of something different than I think. That was the first insight. I needed that to look in the other direction. 
I wasn't even willing to take my eye off the prize to look in that direction. So that had to be my first insight. So when I go back and look at that, what Michael did for me, um, it was nothing about him sharing the principles. It, I mean, while those were great when we had the conversations, it wasn't it. It was that he made me, he made me feel safe enough in our discussion and our times together that I was willing to look left or right to see something else. Like I was willing to take off my armor for a second and, and say that I'm bleeding. Like, damn, I only got to dress the wound. I'm willing for a second because I'm safe. You know, I'm in, I'm in a secure zone right now. I got somebody overwatching me. I'm willing to look at other areas of, of my life where I'm supposedly vulnerable to attack. And that is how full circle for me, I've started helping people with trauma. Uh, while conversations of the principles come up, it's it's my work. But most importantly for me is people who, most people who are experiencing traumatic experiences live believing that outside circumstances control their inside feelings. I get it. I too, just like you said, you and your friend, I too remember that. So if I know that they believe these things out here are hurting them, then me screaming at them, it's just your thinking, is, in my opinion, it's it's a lack of awareness. It's um it's condescending in a way, not the words, not the words, the energy in the words. Because the energy in the words fail to account for I don't live like the way that you do. You know this happens inside out. I don't. So that's like looking at a five-year-old and saying, what's the square root of 10? And the five-year-old is like, wait, I'm only coloring in the lines at school. We haven't even started square root. How are you fussing at me and punishing at me for missing problems about square root when we didn't even start? We're just coloring in the lines. Are you safe? Do you even understand what safety means right now, given that your mindset is so off and so scanning for threats right now? Do you understand the difference in danger and actual um, traumatic thoughts coming through? Do you, can you tell the difference? Can you see? Just like you can go to a movie theater and get scared at the content of the movie, like run out the theater for Saw. I, Saw is one of the scariest movies in the world. I won't even watch that crazy. Like they're cutting off legs and all. Like I don't even want to see it. But I, even though I know it's fake, even though I know they're they're squirting the blood, they're they're they got cameras, they're they're making a production. I have to forget all that for Saw to scare me though. And that's the same thing with trauma. When you respond or when you react. From, from the disorder side of the coin. You've forgotten the truth of who you are. And that happens innocently because the movie in front of you has scared the shit out of you. But just like when we run out the movie theater and I look at Rick and I was like, bro, that was scary. Woo. And we kind of laugh about it. And Rick goes, you're a big punk, man. And I was like, I know. And we walk back in the movie. What happens is outside, we remember we remembered the truth. And then we go back inside and it's a different experience. So when I have episodes now where my heart rate raises or one of those stories kind of goes back through, for me, all I do is go, oh, okay. Let's look left. Let's look right. No, everything ain't chill. Go cool, back. I'm back here with you, Rich. Before, no matter what, if I look left and I look right, even though there was no danger, I still was consumed by their thoughts. So I never came back to our conversation. And so I teach people post-traumatic stress potential because that's the other side of the coin. Um, I heard Bob Proctor, an old coach, say once, fear and faith both require you to believe in something unseen. You choose. And that's both sides of the coin. You either choose, not, again, and it's not saying choose in the sense that I'm going after wanting to make myself suffer. 
No, it, it it's innocently. I'll give you that. But there is a choice. There is a moment where the road veers and you take one path versus the other. So it sounds like what you're saying is we have this reaction. We have this in the moment reaction, just like your your son who rushed out and, and took care of that. And then afterwards, there's a story. <laughs> and afterwards. then afterwards, the, <laughs> no. we, we just do what we need to do in the moment, in, even mm-hmm. in these, these scary situations, because we're moved by greater wisdom. And then afterwards, our ego mind comes in. It's this protective mind. It's this, of course, this lizard brain that says, "Okay, that we need to make sure that that never happens again. Never happens again. (laughs) Even though wisdom just took care of it, (laughs) ego mind comes in and says, "Okay, we're good. We're gonna create a plan and we're gonna scan." And it's it's so funny because I met with a client who was well, was also in the military, and he was scanning while we were coaching together Mm -hmm. he was checking threats and i just i didn't tell him oh don't do that like that's just thought going going away you don't have to tell it to stop you just kind of say oh okay you see it in a new way like you're pointing to oh that's thought and then seeing that that's thought means oh i don't have to take it as seriously i'm safe right now yeah. And and it sounds like for you that needed to be kind of a little glimpse first. You had this little glimmer of what if yeah. I'm creating all of this? Mm-hmm. What if that this isn't the truth? This isn't this experience that's happening within me that feels so real. Mm-hmm. What if there's there's just a little bit of disbelief that I can have about it. like in the movie. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of opened the door. That just cracked it just enough. And that was the gift that maybe Michael gave to you. Yes. Michael, Michael cracked the door. I, I mm-hmm. and and it's funny, Rick brought that up. Me and Michael have been talking about this because I, I work for him now and I teach courses and we travel together. And we were laughing about how people assumed that from that day, our relationship was just this budding, great, I'm on this mystical ride of, hell no. Like, I was, no way. Like, I was fussing with this dude on a regular. Like, every time he would challenge me, I'm like, that's not, I can't have that life you're talking about. It's not for me. Like, cool, you helped me with this one thing, bro, but that's not real life. Like I had issues on race. I had issues on money. I had issues on, like I had issues on a whole bunch of shit, man. And I kept for about a good year, about a good year. And I think the last one of the funniest times is I was downstairs and, and screaming at him, what the fuck do you want from me? And I'm crying, snot coming out my nose. I'm not this guy. I'm I'm never going to be comfortable in this world. I'm just it's just a this a whole sad song. I'm I'm screaming it right, and and he looks at me, man, with this smile, with this peace, with the certainty that he knew what the hell he was talking about, and that certainty, that that grounded position, is what made me go, okay, it's worth looking at. Like I could feel that. So I, it took me probably all of that happened. That was 2018. All of 2019 was trying to prove him wrong. I went at everything. I, I, everything. I tried my best. I was like, I am going to get this fucker. I'm going to prove him wrong. I, I wasn't trying to take his business down. You know what I mean? I ain't trying to mess with his livelihood, but I couldn't wait to show up to watch football with him on Sunday and say, oh, I found the spot. It don't work here. I found a spot, and that's how that's how I became, you know, Rob. Now, as you see out in the world, well, I'll, I'll just go anywhere, play with anybody, do anything because I tried, bro. I did not want to believe this. 
I wanted my story to be true because it made me feel good about the things that I didn't like about myself. It gave me something. You know, I can be an asshole and people would probably say, well, you know, Rob used to be in the game, man. He had a hard living. Like he'd have been to jail. You know, he'd have did this or he'd have did that. Or, or people say, like, man, you know, he got PTSD. He'd have been through this. And that's not right. That's that's just not right. But I'd rather believe that. You know, I, I'd rather stay in the world where trying to silence rich voice was easier than just being okay with who he was as a person. No, no, because if rich disagrees with me, that means something's wrong with me, then no, no, screw rich. Rich is the problem. I had a lot of that. And so by 2020, it was like when it all fell down, I thought I was walking into a depression because the entire fabric of my entire life had dissolved. There was no identity. Man, everything, I'm 48 now. Everything about me, bro, came from either being some type of athlete, every accolade, everything I've ever worn, every, uh, that, that built the little mini me. You know, that, that was the little transformer that walked out on stage. But man, if you would have asked me anything past the normal, you know, when people say, how you doing? If anybody would have pushed past my, oh, I'm good. I would have fell apart on stage. But they took it. And they backed off. When I realized he was possibly right, it was scary. It was dark. But it felt like it was where I was supposed to be. And he told me, he told me this one story where he says, a man can wander in the room for 40 years, right? And in the dark, knocking over furniture, breaking things. And one day that man stumbles over to the light and flips the switch. He said, once that light switch comes on and he looks out in front and sees what's there, he has one of two decisions to make one decision one side of the coin is he can beat himself up for all the shit he knocked over while he was walking in the dark that's an option that's one side of the coin that's one thing you could do or you could do the other side which is be grateful for the light because now you don't have to knock anything over but that choice is up to you again it's a it's a point in which it bees where we take or we choose to grab the fear-based thinking or the faith-based thinking. It's whichever one makes us feel most comfortable. My little brother loves faith-based, I mean, fear-based thinking. It's just the way he rationalizes and gets to his um, decisions. It's it, And it works for him in a sense, other than him being mad all the time, you know? But I can't stop that. He'll see it when he see it. You know, I won't ever tell him it's his thoughts. Because I haven't sat down and explained to him what his thoughts mean or what that even means when I say it. And that's, again, Rick, why I thought it was when I heard it, I felt so moved by because it, it was like, wait, you haven't even, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like it came with this, for me, it came with an arrogance that I know something you don't know. You know, I got this key to life. You got to, you know, talk to me. I got it. You need it. I need to fix you. I'm good type thing. It was like, nah, that's bullshit too. That's that's a load of crap too. You know, with 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 dealing with people in trauma, once they feel safe, you'll get the work done. But there is no work before they feel safe. So whether that's I'm responding to them, Wendy, as a nurse, whether Rick, I'm responding as a paramedic, it, it does not matter until that person feels their felt sense of safety. Not the one I think is, I, I, to me, I'm sitting here like, man, you okay? Like, calm down. Not to the person who's spinning in their mind, though. That person, life is about to end, and they feel it. Who would I be to tell them otherwise? To tell them otherwise. But I could sure as hell stand next to them, hold their hand, and be like, hey, bro, hey, sis, you okay? I know, I know. Come on, keep walking. I know. I got you, though. We take a step, take a little bit more. 
Once I see that first breath, you're okay. Now let's talk. Now let's have a conversation. But coming at somebody that I've never met before who came out of domestic abuse, it's like, yeah, that's these things called mind, thought, consciousness. It's just your thinking. You should get over that shit, all right? That's the three principles. Hint, see you next week. I, I lose it, bro. I, like, I, It just don't work for me that way. Some people may be good at getting away with it, but for me, the only reason the principles apply to my work is I understand that one, we live in separate realities and what that person experiences is a result of their thinking. So that just means that I don't have to worry. I can stay grounded. It means my the principles in my work means I can listen underneath the words. List, the principles in my work uh, goes that, oh, when somebody is communicating to me, they are in no way telling me anything of value about me. They're actually telling me their mindset, their state of mind at that moment. So if I'm driving down 405, which is a huge highway here, and somebody honks the horn and gives me the middle finger, not that it happens often, every other day, but... <laughs> They give me the finger and stop it. Watch going. That has nothing to do with my lack of vision. That is simply saying that person's state of mind right now is disturbed to the point they feel the need to vocalize to me to get the fuck out their lane. Again, nothing about my value of my eyesight. Nothing about my, my value as a person. Nothing about any of that. That just says what their mindset is. And if I understand what their mindset is, then I know how to interact. Because when somebody's angry, they're not listening. So why would I try to outshout you? That's why the principles are important in my work. When Because if you're shouting, I shouldn't be. The principles are important in my work because they've taught me that I am nothing but love at my core. And that that same love that is in me is within each individual that I come in contact with. So if I remember that, I'm not playing a game of fixing anybody. I'm just trying to get them to see themselves. Because when they see themselves, they'll do exactly what I did. They'll challenge my words. They'll go find out for themselves. But man, they're going to stand up and they're going to live their life. Their voice will start coming out. They'll start engaging. They'll start to be heard in their community. And then they, they live their life. But I, as far as the three words and trying to get you to understand up, I'm out of that game. It and 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 it, it's not to say it's not important. It comes into play at times and this and that, but I understand it. You get it when I embrace and hold you as a as a as a uh, client, just like I said Michael did with me. Like we met at a dinner party. He didn't say nothing about no principles, but I knew at that dinner party I wanted to hang out with him again. I told my wife, it's like that dude pretty cool. So that's that's kind of how I view it. And again, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm just the guy who once curled up in a ball and questioned if he wanted to live the rest of his life this way. To being now the guy who wakes up excited about whatever it is he's going to experience. That's the only thing I got, that gap between those two guys. I'll tell you what the walk was like. I'll tell you how dark it was. I'll tell you reference points. Hey, watch that street. You know, you can walk down it, but they rob you on that street. That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing with this. Hmm. The, the, the thought that your mind robs you, robs you of experience. Hmm. The, the power of your thinking can, can yeah. rob you. Yeah. Hmm. And, and I also love that you were speaking to that, that space that there's a groundedness that we can bring to the conversations that we have mm -hmm. with other people. Yeah. And if we're coming from that groundedness, they can still tell their story, but it's this, this neutral space of listening that you can see through it. Mm -hmm. You don't validate it. You don't, because a lot of the times I think that everybody gets their story validated, whether it's trauma or not. And the, I, this this world is just validating our stories left and right. 
And everybody's like, well, of course you're upset if that happened. But when we can come from that neutral space and, and listen without validating, then the story tends to kind of peter out. And then they're like, oh, they can see, oh, I'm safe. Yeah. Wow. And then they can start to look around like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the ego might come in and try and fight it. And say, no, no, it, it fights. Oh, yeah. No, this is important. Look at this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's, it's like, hey, I, I'm important. I need, I need to have my say. And then you test it out. And then you see. Then and, and that's a process, maybe that some mm -hmm. people need to go through. Maybe some people don't. Some people can just have an insight. Mm -hmm. But that it sounds like okay. You 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 let there be a safe space. Sometimes they can let there be an opening. And then sometimes they can choose, like you said, to see it in a new way. Yeah. Rich, I don't, and it may be easier because my job in the military was a protection agent, but I see this just like that. It was like, we looked for areas we were vulnerable. Hmm. Where are our resources vulnerable? And most humans are vulnerable around traumatic experiences because their, their, their mindset shifts to a protection mode where the actual what's in front of them may not actually be what's in front of them. So it's this, we would go, we would do um, like, I'm trying to think of a secure, a huge security incident that would be, well, it doesn't matter. My point is seeing those vulnerabilities and being able to address them before a problem happens in a sense, right? It's similar on this side. Um, I'm just listening to go, oh, that part right there, you don't feel safe in your relationship. And when you don't feel safe in that relationship, you don't want to be yourself. You start, you start being quiet, you start playing small, and there goes the lack of engagement in life in that relationship. Okay, so now I still got my career and my kids. Okay, my relationship is messed up, but I still got the kids in it. Okay, and now I don't feel safe at work anymore. And now my work is overwhelmed. And I'm starting to play small there. And I'm not as engaged in life there either. Now it's like, okay, now I got two parts of my life that I don't feel secure in, that I got to protect myself from. And the last one with the kids, you know how kids are. You're raising one now. <laughs> they are flipping a minute. They have their own way of going through things, you know. Um, but yeah, man, it's, and I don't want to, I do not want to um, belittle or demean the experiences that people go through. Sexual abuse, sexual assault, domestic violence, mass shootings, um, things like that. That is in no way, I'm not, attempting to say those things don't matter because they hurt they hurt a lot what i'm saying is that when those things happen your makeup as a human being has given you a power to walk through it that's all i'm saying i'm not saying that it's going to be easy to walk through it i'm just saying any traumatic experience you face that you live through there is a power within you to overcome it mentally as well. That we have that, that wellness inside. Inside. It's unblemished. Mm -hmm. Even though we can cover it up. Even though we can have thoughts that, and a story that makes it seem like it's not the case. Well, that's the reason we go outside. Like, so... And, and this is just raw, right? I used to think when I was feeling like the discomfort in my body, I had that confused with my innate well-being. Mm -hmm. My innate well-being doesn't have feelings. It's the spirit. The feelings I have is my human experience. The unsettling in my stomach is because I have a stomach because I'm human. 
Not because my spirit was touched. My spirit is untouchable. And when I realized, oh, I've been mistaking these, um, these sensations in the body as human as being my spirit being broken. And that's not true. The spirit can never be broken. The spirit can't be damaged. The spirit has no social economic status. The spirit has no gender. The spirit has no, no um, diagnosis in any of that. And because of that confusion for me, I thought, oh, my spirit's broken. I got to go outside of myself for the answer. Because inside I'm hurt and I'm broke. And it was like, no. When I saw that, then coming back inside only made sense. Like I didn't found myself mid, mid, like mid ready rich to curse somebody out. Because I'm right at the point of, oh, this is 100% your fault. Until I say, this is 100% your fault in my head. And I go, life doesn't work that way, Rob, stop. And it's like, oh, I, you's about to get it. And just walk on off. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I had a guy curse out a Starbucks barista. And she turned out to be younger than my youngest daughter. Ooh, I was mad. I told my, like, I rapid fire thoughts in my head. Like, oh. I got to do this to him. I'll do this to him. I'm going to prove to him. You don't hurt a young lady like that. I'm, I'm this big protection guy. You're not going to do that on my watch. And when I got close enough to attempt to be harmful toward the guy, the overwhelming feel of love hit me rich where all I could hear was his pain. Remember earlier when I said listening underneath the words? He wasn't cursing out a Starbucks barista about an order. He was screaming, I am in so much pain in my life. Does that make sense? It's not, it wasn't the order. It wasn't she put whole milk in a skim milk order. He was screaming, there's a lot of pain going on in my life. So much pain that if somebody put skim milk instead of whole milk, that's enough for me to explode and go on a tyrant to call a teenager some of the most worstful words used in our language. Nothing about the milk. Everything about the life. He's telling me his mindset. So the next thought came was, Rob, how, does it even make sense to inflict harm on somebody in so much pain already? And he was like, no. No, no, I'm not. I can't have no sympathy for no butthole. No, no, he he did this. He did, And I got to bring the story back, right? I, I pick it back up and I put it in my face and it's like, it goes down. And it's like, now I'm crying, driving home crying, mad at myself for caring about the guy who was mean. About, you see what I mean? Where I go with all this, right? But again, when I settled, when my mind soothed from that, what I saw was, that's why I don't have to say the words. Because I heard it. I can see it. Just have to live it. I don't ever have to say the words. I just have to live it. I just have to look at somebody with the feeling that you can walk through this. I just have to look at somebody with the feeling that you're not going to walk this alone if me and you are in, in connection and team about this. If me and you have a shared agreement through coaching or through friendship or relationship that we're gonna walk this together. And that's that's what I'm showing up with. I don't care what we're facing. Whether we got a 10 foot wall, whether we got a, a 20 foot hole, who gives a crap? Let's get it. Like this is what we're going through and we're going through it together. We will cry together, we will laugh together. We're gonna play some music, might sip some whiskey, watch some football, but we'll do it. We'll figure it out. That's that's life out the trauma for me, man. I think that is very profound. And if you're listening to that, listen from that deeper level. And and I wanted to maybe open it up to some questions, some comments some insights we have a, a few minutes left 
I'm going to change it to a gallery view on my screen so I can see all of your faces. And thank you again, Rob, for coming today. If you have questions for Rob, I feel like we have probably enough people here where you can just unmute yourself and ask. I think, Wendy, you might still have that question about it being faster, and we can address that in the next couple of minutes, and it, anybody else as well. Uh, yeah, I think the context it has been rounded out. Thank you, Rob, very much. Just really so authentic and so real that when y your safety factors are primary and that's what the body is supposed to do is to keep us safe at all times. Mm -hmm. Make sure I take in enough oxygen so that Wendy can talk on Zoom. Make mm -hmm. sure I expel enough carbon dioxide so Wendy doesn't fall asleep. Make sure that, you know, the food that she just ate, the tuna sandwich that she just ate is- <laughs> That she did not share. Yes, that tuna that sandwich. Not share. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Is going through and 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 mm -hmm. dropping off proteins. And so my body is on 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Let's let's make it happen. We, we got to yeah. keep this girl moving. We got to keep this lady going. And the, and, and there's a safety factor all the time. Like, I don't sit down in a chair two feet in front of the chair. I wait until my mm -hmm. body's on top of it. So my body does know, don't sit yet. Wait, right. back up a little bit more before you sit, because you're going to land on your butt on the floor if you don't do that. Right. So it's always like that. So the context you rounded out is that when somebody is hypervigilant in the moment saying something's wrong, I just heard a loud bang and it reminds me of my days in Vietnam and I'm afraid somebody's shooting at me right now. That is not the time to talk to them about anything of anything. <laughs> no, to, no, no, uh, no, not anything. at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I and I really love what you said when you notice that they breathe more, yeah. they take a breath, when they take a deep breath, they are, their body is relaxing and they right. and and you can it's it's sort of like the um the uh, snow globe, right? Mm -hmm. When it's like this, there's no use talking to anybody like that. Oh, not but at as all. soon as as soon as the breathing starts to settle down and you actually begin to see my little cardinal that's in there, mm -hmm. that might be a time to be in the and you see the clarity coming. You mm -hmm. can see through, right? That's a time to talk. So I really appreciated that and the fact that those signals are important. Mm -hmm. I am concerned that I am being shot at like I was in Vietnam. That's really important information for you as a or the person to get clear on yes. that that isn't happening. Yeah, yeah. And once it settles a little bit and they have, like you said, that half inch of saying, oh, I have a choice to feed the fear mm -hmm. or to feed the um, faith. faith. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And even what I love about that, Wendy, is, again, that's for the client, but even one step back. When I notice, you'll bring your snow globe up again and shake it for me. If I'm talking while that is up, what that is telling me is for some reason, I can't see their well-being. Because even though I know they can't hear anything I'm saying, I'm trying to force my words into them in hopes that they're going to be okay in the next few seconds. Remember, what I say is my mindset. If I'm talking to you while your snow globe is going wild, my mindset is I also don't think you're safe. I also am scared. I also have bought into your story. I also think you are broken. Because if not, I'll just wait mm -hmm. until there's some you, clarity. You, you notice when I know. we waited, it's clear and you can actually see me a little bit behind mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So I, I learned that, that, that too. That, I, I yeah. used to put that on people. I used to put it on people at first, and then I realized, oh no, that's me too. I got to see their well being. Great. That's I great. have to see their well being. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, if thank I, you. If, if I want to be the lighthouse, yes. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I um, I think I heard uh, maybe just talk with talk this through. But so your um your son in the fire in the trash can, mm -hmm. you um, 
and the feelings he got af after, mm -hmm. after, right? Because because there's you're in the zone, you're doing what you need to do, right? And it's only after that it when gets, you're safe. When you yeah, yeah, yeah. When you are physically safe, that the mind can run rapid. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious because I, I had an interesting uh, uh, thing happen, or uh, I call it an insight, anyways, around uh, when I was camping. Me and my brother-in-law were separate vehicles, and we're we're traveling up a very narrow road, uh, so narrow that you could basically look over the cliff. And it was two legs. We got up to the first leg, and and he says, "I can't go any further." He says, "My anxiety, my panic, dis you know, it's like I I can't." If we're going any further, you can take my wife further and, and I'll just hang back. And I said, oh, I said, that's cool. I said, no, no problem. I, I too was having I mean, feelings about that, mm -hmm. right? But the label and the meaning I put between them were so different. We were traveling yeah. mm -hmm. the road, right? And I, and I, and I think sometimes that, that, you know, like with your son, it's it's a mislabel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? It's just, you know, it's like so I, I said to, I said to my my brother in law, uh I said, um I said, what I find interesting though is is even in spite of what you were going through, you still made it up up halfway mm -hmm. up the mountain. Mm -hmm. so that's <laughs> the part that's really intrigues me. Yeah, yeah. And I and I said, so I said, like, where do you think your panic attacks are coming from? And he says, Well, when I was eight years old, I used to have these reoccurring dreams of falling off a cliff. So anytime I get close to a cliff, right? And I says, oh, I says, that's cool. I says, because I think I think my my little nervousness is telling me to to be safe. Hug, yeah, just pay attention. <laughs> pay attention, exactly. <laughs> right? Um, long story short, he he finished the mountain on his own, mm. right? And I, it was just like, I said, you know, it's like, isn't that interesting that in spite of whatever's going on, you're still able to, and then maybe, and maybe just maybe we're just, you know, having an, a misinterpretation, Yeah. right? I mean, yeah, you're going to have adrenaline going through after putting out a fire. Who doesn't? <laughs> mm -hmm. But what you label that adrenaline, it could be some of everything. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And if you get an expert coming coming to you saying, "Oh, that's that's that," yeah, yeah, this is what we need to do every time that happens. I mean, yeah, and it's why it doesn't work. Yeah, like I tell people all the time. When I I love this when folks say, "Like Rob, I I really want to work with you because I've tried everything and it doesn't work," and I was like, "Oh, whew, well, that's good," <laughs> and they be going like, "Why is that good?" I said, "Because that that's a great part." For us to start, that means the reason none of the shit that you've ever done to fix yourself has worked is because you're not broken. So that's the reason it hasn't worked. And and you just now let me know you know that, you know. Um, so yeah, we we start thinking about it. There's I, I say it in the sense that both of us are traveling and we both have to get to the other side of this mountain or as in your sort to the top of the mountain. There is an experience of getting to the top of this mountain with physically crippling anxiety. That's possible. If you push through it and still get there. There's an experience of going to the top of that mountain, enjoying everything about the hike. Even the little rustling in the bushes, that means a snake, which I'm running. <laughs> See how I do in hiking, right? But whichever way you want to get to the other side of that experience is totally up to you. Again, you can take it and be anxious, feel the whole way. Okay. Or you can be there with the experience and in real time respond to what's there. Again, once we're on the other side, nobody really cares how we got there. It's just a different experience, though, when you know you don't have to take the anxiety with you. You don't have to take the depressive thinking with you. You don't have to, you know, lug all that stuff in your rucksack. Just makes it a different experience. Doesn't mean it might not be tough or difficult. 
you know, me and Rich was talking about this earlier with um, older parents and older in-laws. Um, my uh, father-in-law is 80, I think 84, 86, and we're close, right? Um, that's going to be difficult because I, I take him to the movies every other weekend. I spend a lot of time with them and things like that. But I also know that's a part of life. And so if I don't forget that part, then when I'm present with him, I just get to love him. But if I'm thinking about all the shit that's going to happen when he passes and this, and I'm like, don't, don't walk there. Don't do that. Come here. Don't. We're not having any fun. And so it's it's just this, this thing of real time moments. Like again, snapshots, not a video recording. It's a snapshot. The traumatic experience happened. If you physically make it through it, you are alive. And you made it through a mass shooting, a, a, a bombing, or anything like that. You now, physically having made it through it, have an opportunity to decide how that experience will be attached to your life. It will become part of your identity in some way. As the thing that meant stopped you from ever being who you wanted to be, as the thing that gave you the experience, you know, the the resilience to go be who you want to be, or just something that stops you from living all together. Again, it's not the experience, though. It's what we're thinking about what that experience means that does all the stopping or the shifting of behaviors. At least I think so. Nice. You think you want to have time for one more or we can wrap? Yeah, let's do, let's do one more. All right, one more. If, if there's one more. If there's one more, yes. Uh, I'm going to say, please give us one more because I don't want to make it seem like I just did so well that I said everything <laughs> so good that nobody had any questions. Like, don't don't leave me with that thought because my ego will run that one too. So please, somebody ask a question so I know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Yeah, I <laughs> uh, this has been fabulous here of the club here. But um, so my question is, my husband is in the midst of tremendous anxiety and depression. Um, and he's making up his mind about what it is, and it's you know, it's head trauma and you know, he was played football and he was in sports and blah blah blah. But nothing that he's done, you know, he's 75. I mean, the last time he played these portraits, you know, 55 years ago. But he's, so he's looking down and I can see that is he's just twirling in his thoughts and they're all shit. And I hear what you're saying that, you know, he has to get to a place where he feels safe first. Mm -hmm. But I, and I, but I go, Dan, look up, let go. Your thought. So give me some... <laughs> that's you, probably you not, know, that's like that what you just said hey let me tell you it's all yeah, you yeah it's you, just, so, you just start me. cynthia you just startled me when you said look up and i don't even i'm i'm in a good mood right now when you <laughs> said when you said look up i was like oh shit yes yes i'm here i'm <laughs> like what, what what that energy you said look up with was oh, oh my god i am super scared right now Mm. Mm. I am scared. It is you. You yeah. are not yeah. him. You are scared right now. Yeah. So, yeah. what do you think happens when a person looks out from their experience of being scared and see the one person in front of them as terrified as they are? You think that maybe make me believe what I'm believing is more true? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Okay. You know myself, eh? What? <laughs> When, when that's your husband, I could also hear that you love him. Mm, sometimes, right? sometimes, <laughs> got it, got it. Well, <laughs> here's here's two things I know that are legal in marriages: hugs and hand holding. Mm. Have you ever tried when he's spinning to just go hold his hand and hug him and sit there and let him spin? Mm. No, I haven't tried. 
Because what happens when you're spinning and the other person isn't, you notice they're not spinning. And then you wonder why they're not spinning. It's because they see something else. And then you get curious to want to see what they see so they don't spin. Mm. But but if you spin with me, oh shit, we're gonna dance this for the dog. <laughs> we, we're gonna dance this way for the rest of our lives. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Just let him let him know he's okay. Because again, you know, you're sitting in your house. Yeah. He hasn't played ball. It ain't like you got to get it into him before Sunday next week because he's going to suit up for the for the Cowboys. Hopefully we'll take him if he's a good player. Like we hurt right now. But but you know he's not playing on Sunday or Saturday, whatever his sport was. You know he's sitting physically in the chair or on the couch in front of you. Your roof's not falling in. You're like, wait, I know my husband is safe right now. So let me calm down. And then when I calm down, I just walk over, kiss him on the forehead, sit next to him, and just listen. Don't try to stop it, because it's going to stop itself. Like, my 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 rants with Michael went from 30-minute rants to 20-minute rants to catching myself ranting and stopping it to, man, I was about to rant, but fuck it. All right, here's what I want to talk about. You know what I mean? Like, it's... A, it's a, it's a way you walk through it, you know? Um, and, and he doesn't rant. He goes absolutely silent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, But I hear what you're saying. The, the, the process is the same. It's, you're right. Yeah, just I, just I, let him know. I, I, angry, frightened, whatever. Then doesn't that's matter. That's a place to uh, be, yeah, coming from. Oh, yeah. I hear you. Thank you, Rob. This was, uh, <laughs> that's, I have your name. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was fabulous. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear. Thank you so much. And thank you, Wendy, for inviting me. Did she, did she tell you she wasn't going to give you no tuna sandwich if you came either? <laughs> did she give you, I am on this tuna sandwich. Wendy, next time I see you, you got to take me to get a tuna sandwich because you made that sound so good, the one you was eating. <laughs> it's going to have mayonnaise in it, Rob. I oh, know I that that's no, not good for you. That ain't I good know, at all. I know. I'm just saying. Right. And that is not my thinking. Mayonnaise is just sucks. That's not my thinking. <laughs> I'm joking. Rich, what we got, sir? Well, that, thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Rob, especially. And I know that if you liked the kind of that last 15, 20 minutes, the next meeting that we're going to have is going to be, that's going to be the whole meeting, basically. Uh, you'll get to talk with me. You'll get to share insights, maybe from the last two times that we've met. And I'm going to keep looking for, I've got a couple people lined up. I'm placing the uh, meeting in the chat. Michael McDonald is going to be coming. On. That's one of the homies. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> I love he's, him. He's going to be coming on in November. I, I have him for sure. I'm talking with Dick and Bettinger as well. Uh, and we'll we'll probably have him in November ish time frame, and we'll uh, it's going to be exciting. So thanks for coming. And then Rob, I heard you have a free resource for trauma. Yes, I just put it. I put it into the thing. Free blueprint. Dot. I'm Rob Cook. Dot com. Um, is a resource I put together. Um, somebody reached out to me and was like, "Hey, my son's going through PTSD," and I just done a few resources to send to him. But thought like, hey, with a few shifts, I can make this available for, you know, to everybody. Um, and so, yeah, it's a couple of videos of some writings, a few stories of mine on PTSD and an actual few lessons on the the switch of what I call the misunderstanding. But uh, totally free. Uh, if it makes sense and helps you, great. If you start listening to it and you're like, what the hell? Just just it's just throw it in trash. It's fine. I'll see you around. <laughs> yeah. I just ahead, put a W. I just put a www dot in front of free blueprint dot I am Rob oh, good com, yeah, yeah. and it didn't it didn't load. It did. So no, mm. um, but I can try it again. Did anybody else try? Soon as I hit w that link, it populated for me. Yeah, don't put anything in front of it. Oh, all right. Thank you. And if not, you can get it on my website at umrobcook.com. It's on there as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, thank y'all so much for, for having me and listening. And I'm here if you have questions. Um, and yeah, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> the, you, you are sharing the, the most precious resource you have, which is your time and attention. So we, we appreciate you all. Thanks for, thanks for thank coming you. and listening. And, and hopefully you heard something new that will impact your the next couple of days or, or months or maybe even years. Mm, I love that. All right. Well, Y'all take be care, good. everybody. You're welcome to unmute and say goodbye. And Thank you. Thanks. See you in fever Bye. in a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Reg, thanks, Rob. God bless you, Rob. Bye. Bye. Uh, take Bye. care, Rich. Take care, everybody.